Namaste Narayan ji, how are you doing today? Namaste, I'm, I'm uh, having a great conference and uh, we've come to the end of it. So it's been a three uh, day conference here. Um, we've really enjoyed your presence. Um, first, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your history with WAVES, um, with the organization and how how has that been for you? So I'm, an, I'm a resident of Atlanta for the past uh, 40 years. So the people who organized the first uh, WAVES conference are my friends. The community friends but uh, I was not directly involved in it I of course I heard what was going on but I am an uh, engineering professor and uh, like uh, most uh, uh, engineering professors we stick to being engineering professors so you read all these things and you say yeah it's somebody else's problem but uh, by the um, early 2000s or actually I would say uh, when the Indian nuclear test happened in 1998 I decided, like many others, that uh, I could not remain an idle spectator, uh, that I should participate in countering the sheer misinformation and propaganda that was going around. And I will just uh, take a moment to give you an example. Um, so I live in Atlanta. I do aerospace engineering. A uh, lot of what we do, our students go into the military, among other things. Our research comes from the military. Uh, Atlanta is home to Dobbins Air Force Base, the Lockheed uh, fighter plant. Uh, Lockheed used to be a bomber plant actually and uh, I think uh, the headquarters of the 24th Infantry Division. So if there is one thing I have been very conscious of since I first started working at Georgia Tech in 1978 mm -hmm. is that we have always been a prime target for anybody's nuclear attacks. Mm -hmm. The place where I worked had a big sign on it saying nuclear fallout shelter. Mm -hmm. So on the first day of any world war we expected to be wiped out. So after the 1998 um, nuclear tests by India, uh, there was an article in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution describing how these high school students in Marietta, Georgia, which is right next to Dobbins Air Force Base and Lockheed, could not sleep at night because they were feeling so unsafe that uh, India was, had tested nuclear weapons. This is an example of the kind of uh, sheer propaganda. So uh, people like me actually came out and said, uh, started countering these things and said this is nonsense, India needs these things. That is how I actually got involved and my big revelation was when an, a, an opinion poll came out done by somebody in the Indian American community saying what do you think of these nuclear tests? And at the time I said look, I don't know about your perspective but I think this was extremely necessary, high time and I'm so happy about it. And I thought I would be like in the 1% minority. It turned out I was in the 93% majority of Indian Americans who felt exactly like I, and it was a, that that was how I started getting involved. I realized that most of us felt the same way, except we all thought we were the only ones who felt like that. Waves itself, uh, so I have been asked from time to time to help counter uh, what we see as the arrogance of uh, some people in academia. So when university professors and deans come out with outrageous statements. It falls to people like me to say, no, that is not how good academia works. Okay, if somebody writes something totally abusive and, uh, and uh, inflammatory and, uh, you know, offensive. At my workplace, that is not considered freedom. That is considered being a jerk. Okay, and uh, the, for people to come out and say, oh, we believe in academic freedom. Oh, well, we said, look, no, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable in academia as I know it. It's not acceptable at your academia. If I know your academy, your, your university is very good. If people actually know what is going on there, they'll kick you out in a hurry. So th we had to come out and say this. So this was my role uh, to speak out uh, the truth on behalf of, um, well, you know, what I knew. Uh, so then I, people said, oh, why don't you come to Waves? And I said, I'm not going to come and present stuff on, you know, in religion and uh, these things. Like I'm not an engineering professor. So I... I participated and presented a paper on how to bring a distributed micro renewable energy architecture to India to, to uh, bring up the level of um, energy availability in India, which is uh, something that, you know, so it's very technical, but uh, uniquely, and I pointed out what is unique about India as opposed to what is taught in the textbooks that are derived from what works in the West, you see. And I, and I don't want to go too much into that, that's in my papers. So that was how I went to the first WAVES conference. That was an excuse really to go and, and I listened to all the papers and realized that this is truly a multidisciplinary society. Okay? They had paper, I mean, what is Vedic knowledge? I thought it was all, 
you know, Sanskrit slogans or whatever. But it turned out that it is all of knowledge, which is it, what it should be. So uh, everyone has a role to play in waves. This is my first message, actually. So I have been involved at least as a supporter of waves since then. But since then, I only went to perhaps one more waves conference. That was in uh, Delhi in 2016, where we presented a paper on the process that we went through in developing an introductory textbook on Sanatana Dharma. You know, that is again from an engineering professor's point of view saying, how did I learn about my own belief system? How do I go about and find original sources? And go about it like you do in aerospace design. Say, so what is the requirement? And so we laid it out like that and presented that. So then I think these, uh, the Waves people got me. They managed to get me onto the board. And next thing you know, they said, oh, Narayanan, we need somebody to run the next conference. And it's going to be in the US. So why don't you do it? And uh, I, I think I, I, I walked into it with eyes open. Uh, because I really wanted to find out um, what to do and uh, how to m perhaps make a positive difference. Okay? And uh, it was the best way to read the proceedings papers uh, before uh, the another two or three years had elapsed, which was a traditional thing. So one thing we decided up front was that uh, the, the board said uh, we don't care about number of papers, we want to make sure they are quality papers. And so it's your job to um, institute a we want academic peer review because without peer review, we don't have credibility for our, our works. And I agree completely because I've read the proceedings of the past waves conferences. They have fantastic papers. Like, you know, Professor Brij I mean, Dr. Brijesh Lal's papers on how the Saraswati civilization was found. These are fantastic. I had no idea. And it was like, you know, it was th that's not what I learned in the uh, social sciences textbooks. Many, but it's so different and is based on solid research. So I said, oh my goodness, where can I find it? I can't find it on Google. Okay, it doesn't exist. So I said, okay, we've got to fix these problems. We have to make sure these things come out. So that has been my focus and role. It is really to make sure that our best work comes out and, and by peer review. You know, in, in, in academia, you can present papers at the American Institute of Aer um, Aeronautics and Astronautics. And uh, uh, it's an international conference. We put a lot of effort into it. It doesn't even count in my, uh, you know, in my um, academic evaluation system because they say that's not a peer-reviewed publication, okay? Unless the paper goes through full peer review, mm -hmm. the definition is at least two people, preferably three other than the editor, must have read the paper, reviewed it, had the opportunity to make anonymous comments, and the authors have the uh, uh, opportunity to rebut whatever. So this uh, process has to be there for credibility. So this is in academia, you know, so, so panel sitting around and saying, oh, he's from a good family, let's accept his paper. He's not going to cut it. So it has to be merit-based, fact-based uh, peer review and not what my opinion is, but the opinion of the reviewers. That has been my contribution. Uh, we brought that for the first time and we said, we're going to do it in a timely manner so that the proceedings will come out when people show up at the conference. This is standard practice in engineering, but apparently it is not standard practice in, in, yeah. in, uh, in our organizations. We have done it. And I'm very proud about it. I think people are very happy to see that. Thank you so much, Namasteji.